Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there. We were all looking forward to this, but perhaps we will meet someday when all this is over. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the archaeology of volcanic disasters in one part of the world. Um, and I want to try and raise questions for discussion. That's one of my main purposes of this. I won't be able to answer everything, but hopefully raise some questions and maybe some implications about how the archeological research can be relevant to disaster management in the present. Um, many, most, well, disaster managers, people who are working in the modern world think of volcanic eruptions and other kinds of disasters as one-off events. It's a catastrophe, people are, um, you know, maybe deaths, lots of destruction. Um, and I kind of focus just on the one event. But archeologists tend to take a long-term view and also uh, often a comparative view through time or across space. And of course, one thing that we do different that's sometimes hard for you all to understand is that we have to deal with materiality of behavior because that's what's preserved. That gives us a challenge to try and uh, think about the rest of behavior we can't see. But one of the points that I, I want to make by looking at this long-term history of disasters in New Britain is that every disaster has a history. It has a before, it has what happens during, and it has what happens after. But the after of one disaster is the before of the next disaster. So one disaster becomes heritage for the descendants. And that has real implications as to how learning, we as human societies have learning and how things can be passed on. Another interesting point is that a lot of the evidence is on destruction, but disasters can also stimulate innovations and change. And my question that I'm looking at is to what extent that these factors can help contribute to future resilience. Can societies become more resilient over time? So we're gonna look at a, a few rather simple concepts, but it's a way of, of organizing things. So again, most people think of disasters as a collapse. So if we look through time, we might have these, each one of these bars is a disaster of different um, magnitudes and timing. So we might see a chaotic response. And that is after each one of these events, we get completely different behaviors. Things change, there seems to be no continuity through time. And so we just have things, a complete mess and some aspects will be chaotic. One thing we want to look for is, is there any evidence of resilience? That is, can the society return back to some sort of normality? The biological um, definition of resilience is returning to a steady state. Are some things consistent and con uh, continuous through time? And of course, the other is adaptation. Do things in a way get better or change in a directional way? Can we see what, so what of these processes can we see through time if we take a long-term view of uh, a, what I would call a disastrous environment, one that is characterized by a large number of events? So where we're going to look is in the region of Papua New Guinea. And we're going to this area here, which is on the island of New Britain. You can see there's volcanoes everywhere on this island. And we're looking at one particular area called the Willemez Peninsula, where I've been doing my archeology. span But I also point out the area of Rabal and Tabui, which is where some of your team members have been thinking about, also thinking about eruptions. It's on the same island. Um, and Robin, you, you muted yourself. Hi, I'm yeah, sorry. Go. I must have bumped something. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay. 
so there we have where we are. Um, now it's not wanting to, it seems to have, seems to have frozen. Okay. So we're going to start by looking at a very early site called Kupuna Nadari. And this is a small hill, which we were very lucky that the plantation decided they wanted to get rid of it so they could have some nice flat pasture. And they carve through it. And you can see there's a whole series of yellow lines. Each one of those is a volcanic ash or the remnants of a volcanic ash. And they're stacked up about four meters high. Now the people in this group are pointing to stone tools which are in the soil that's formed between the volcanic ash. And the yellow arrow is pointing to stones from an, an ancient earth oven. So this was an amazing find for us because it's four meters down. You don't normally get a chance to look that far down. And it gives us the long, really long-term history. So these are the volcanic layers, different kinds of mainly low magnitude events. We're unable to source them because they're way too eroded to see much in them. And it was also very difficult to date them using um, thermoluminescence because there's no feldspars or quartz left. It's all eroded, it's a volcanic environment. But we get, did get dates. It's, it's probably at least 40,000 years old. The uh, archeology span goes all the way to the bottom of the trench. So that's about the time that people came to New Britain. The earliest, colon, the earliest people in New Britain would have experienced volcanic eruptions and they would have experienced this whole history of eruptions. It's, uh, you know, every few thousand years, there's some sort of event. We found 13 events in, in this. The layer at the top is a more recent um, Holocene event over the hill. But that uh, Pleistocene uh, material is really difficult to study. As I say, it's not well preserved. So most of our evidence has been um, in the more recent period and concentrating on two, the, uh, the results of two volcanoes. The one in the north is called Dakatau and the one in the further the south um, east is Witori. So Dakatau is now a giant caldera at the head of the peninsula. The land down um, to the lower left hand is rising. Who knows when Dakatau will erupt again? It's an unstable place. It's an unmonitored volcano as well. Um, and this is Watori, which last erupted in 2002. Not a very big eruption, but of course disrupted Nobody could fly there, no one could go there, and um, many people lost their fields, but it wasn't too terrible. This is the eruptions that I've mainly been um, working on, starting at the bottom, about 6,000 years. These are all called WK because they're from Watori, and the sequence was worked out by a team of Japanese volcanologists who were in the area. The white, you can see the um, uh, mean dates the, the, um, of the eruptions. So we go up from 6,000, 3,000, 1650, 28, uh, 1280. And then Dakotau erupted about the same time as the eruption WK4. And in fact, Robal erupted exactly the same time as well within 50, 100 years, all three volcanoes on the north coast of New Britain erupted. The VEI is the Volcanic Explosivity Index, and it shows that these volcanoes were, are, these are big, very, very big eruptions, very serious. Um, you don't need to know all the rest of the volcanics, that's the sort of so the Japanese team put together a sort of um, severity index to show the scale of the area that would have been, uh, even in white, would have been pretty much 
blitzed and people would have had to leave the area. So it's the whole center of New Britain is impacted by um, WK1, WK2 was the biggest eruption. WK3 was smaller, but WK4, which was smaller from Watori, also went off the same time as Decatau and Rabal. So the implications for where people could run away to are pretty serious. So in all these eruptions, people would have had to leave um, all the area in color and possibly a little bit further and go someone else, go somewhere else and be away for many hundreds of years before the forest would grow back. So WK2 um, is known for massive pyroclastic flows. You can see the small man at the bottom. And these uh, went 30 or 40 kilometers away from the volcano. So a huge area was completely destroyed. Um, the most of the damage was volcanic ash. These are just pictures of other parts of the world. And the one on the right is the ash from the 2002 volcano. But even though the ash doesn't necessarily kill you, it kills all the vegetation, it fouls the water, it makes it very difficult to breathe. So you might be dead, but you can't survive. You can't stay there. You have to leave until the um, ash can erode enough to allow plants to come back, which can take hundreds of years. However, all this is very good for archeology span because each one of these eruptions leaves a signal across the whole of the landscapes. You can see looking across this deep trench, you can see there are layers of yellow and same in, in this trench. These are layers of yellow. So wherever we are, um, we can identify those layers. They have uh, good characteristic physical attributes. So you can, you can learn them and know where you are in time, which is good because in a tropical, tropical environment, you don't get a lot of radiocarbon opportunities. So what we did was we worked in two areas. One is Garawa Island, which was my first project in the 90s. And then we moved down to what we called the Isthmus area, which was uh, is oil palm, which it meant we had access to large areas. Now, a lot of archaeological work is done in one place called an archaeological site. So you all probably heard of Pompeii, for instance, what happened at the one side of Pompeii. But what we're doing is looking at whole landscapes and try to understand populations over a landscape. So we took a different view. We dug uh, one meter square test pits over large areas. So those squares up in the corner for Garo Island, show them where they are, but of course they're not to scale. We didn't dig that much. There are really only one meter square um, pits. So we dug about 140 of these pits in the two areas in the Isthmus and in on Garo Island. And you can see, I should probably go back. You can see the person in the hole and you can see the volcanic layers. So as you dig down, you know where you are in time. So everything you find, you can put into a chronology. So here's a pit, for instance, and here's the different eruptions from WK1, 2, 3, Dakotau, WK4. Then on top, there's um, a series of eruptions in the last 500 years. These, we hadn't, we had a lot of trouble with these because they were, you can see in this, they're not continuous across the landscape. And we, we haven't really sorted out the last 500 years, but we've got the other periods. And so that's how we know where we are in all these places. And then we can put together a picture across the landscape and through time of what's happening. It's an amazing situation. You don't get this in archaeology very often. Um, so let's look at some of the things we can find out and see 
what how the patterns work out. So we can start by looking at the length of time it took people to come back after the eruption, the length of abandonment in the two areas. Um, so we can see that it's around 150 years in many cases. It's a long time. That's what, seven generations of people before people are, are back and settled. What we also notice is the pattern is not linear. Whoops, sorry. They're not, it's a chaotic pattern. It looks like it's going quite well. WK one, two, and three. Oh, sorry, I'm bouncing around here. Um, get my hands off the keyboard. <laughs> I'm used to standing in front of a screen, of course, and just doing things. Um, so it seems like things are going down, but again, notice that DKWK4 incident where suddenly it's taking people longer. And that's, I think, because they haven't got the social ties. We'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so the abandonment record is slightly chaotic. There's a bit of a trend to it, but when you get a really bad problem, you can't overcome it. You can only go so far. So what about the things that people made and used? Of course, remember this is archaeology. We only have stone. Everything else is rotted away. So we have to make up stories from what we have. So in the early period, we have these amazing tools. And careful look at the scale. These are, you know, 10, 15 centimeters across. These are very large tools made out of a rock called obsidian, which is a volcanic stone it's a glass so it um it's has it's not crystalline it's a glass so it can be shaped very easily by um stone tools and these people made the most beautiful objects um and some of them are very strange shapes which are repeated here's this was just found all the really good ones are found by bulldozers, by the way, not by us. <laughs> um, and this is a, a kind of stone tool called the blade, long and thin, very difficult to make. Uh, all these tools would have required highly skilled people who spent time practicing and learning to make them without breaking them. So we have some sort of specialist production going on. And this is the in the period before 6,000 years ago up to about uh, 3,000 years ago. Then they, after the WK2 eruption, stem tools disappear. And the um, sort of obvious bit of material culture we have is pottery, the first pottery in this area. It's highly decorated by a kind of, it's called um, punctate. So you take something like a comb and you press it into the wet clay to make these sorts of designs. And the Lapis designs were very interested in faces. You can see a modeled face, which we found with a tattoo under the eye. That's a big change. Then, um, Lapita pottery only lives, uh, only survives up to the WK3 eruption, and then it disappears. And then we have nothing very special until after um, WK4 when we get polished and ground stone tools, which is uh, really interesting because these are the things that are supposed to be used for chopping down trees. But we don't get them till about the last 500 years ago in our area. So I don't think their main role was chopping down trees. I think their main role are um, exotic items that were used in exchange with each other. Um, you can see they're, they're very beautiful. So if we look at the material culture record, it's, it's a chaotic record. We have STEM tools pre-WK1 and post-WK1. Then after the really massive eruption WK2, we get pottery. 
and then that goes out after WK3, and then we get um, groundstone tools later. So this is one of these situations where people would say, oh, the, eru the eruptions absolutely destroyed everything and destroyed people and destroyed their culture. But another way of thinking of it is um, if those STEM tools were controlled by old men, if they were status objects that were made in exchange among the knowledge holders and the powerful people, when the eruption came, they were wiped out. And when people had to move to refugee camps, it opened up opportunities for other people to invent other kinds of cultures and take over. So from some perspectives, it's innovation rather than collapse. Just depends how you want to read the story. That's a chaotic pattern. Now back to obsidian. That's our main thing we find. These are um, pictures of obsidian sources where the stone comes from. Uh, and it, you can see how it's in, in the eruption in layers. It's a flow, a rhyolitic flow. And our area is, has four different um, kinds of four sources from different dates which is another interesting issue and another interesting story. Um, and some are, many of them are in this area and then one down near Wittori. These were the main tool. This is the main thing we find when we dig um, the site. It's the main thing that re is, is um, left are the stone tools and lots and lots of obsidian. And we've done quite a bit of work um, studying these tools under high magnification to try and find out what they were used for. They weren't special. Many of them were hardly used at all. Um, they're sharp, so they used for cutting something, usually very casually, but they were made in, in this period, um, well, throughout all the periods, they're made very casually, smashed, not standard, stone tools, no lovely points or anything like that, which is interesting because we'll get to that in a minute. So each one of these sources, you can see the different colors, has a, has a, a very specific um, chemical composition, which you can measure using a number of different techniques. We've been using um, portable XRF most recently, but you can use Newton activation or LA, all sorts of things. And then you can measure the artifacts, which are the black dots. And so find out where the artifacts have come from, which are the sources that they've come from. And that's how you can trace social networks and trading networks by making, um, well, you could draw lines really between the source and where the point of consumption is. So for instance, if we look in the isthmus area, you'll see these um, circle graphs, um, each place with the composition of the different sources where the obsidian comes from. Everyone's getting obsidian from somewhere else in the isthmus and uh, in the isthmus area. It's none of it's local, so it's all imported. And through time, there are different mixes, things coming from different sources, but it persists. It's very, very important. Um, there's lots of obsidian, lots of different social networks going on. That is clearly an important part of the culture of this region. So if we look at um, the obsidian sourcing for the STEM tools, um, the STEM tools are made in two different regions, one in Manas and one in New Britain. They have different obsidians, different compositions. But if you look at the red dots, you see that STEM tools are over a large region and probably the, which these sorts of dots on the edge are also, there's one in over here in Bougainville. Um, so STEM tools are moving over long distances. People are in communication with people over long distances outside our um, disaster area uh, up here. 
So across the island, but also over to New Ireland, across to the mainland, um, as far south here in Ma uh, Ma Missima, over to Bougainville. So there must have been long distance trading networks of some kind. Now, whether these were between high status individuals, people going on long distance voyaging, um, I could go on and on for hours, as you could imagine, um, thinking about what these are. But the point is, people had friends, they had connections, they had social networks over very large areas. Uh, after WK2, the STEM tools are gone, but obsidian is still being moved over even larger distances. This is the period after 3000 years, when of course the um, people move out into the Pacific area. So they move out from the heartland here out to the Pacific and we have obsidian from our area, Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, Vanuatu, all through this area. People are taking it with them and exchanging it. Some people have called it a lifeline back to the homeland. Um, others have said it's a way of identifying people who are like them when they get out there. We don't, we don't really know. But it's also interesting that they don't treat it as a valuable. Um, they're still smashing it up and not using it very much. But a boatload came from Talisea to the Solomons and people almost just dumped it on the beach. It's very much part of their identity and um, part of making social connections. We even have some obsidian uh, from our area over in Malaysia. That's a really one-off thing a little bit later in time. So again, and of course it's, it's being traded all around the local area, all over around New Guinea and in the Admiralty Island in our area. So again, this just shows you um, summary of the sort of sourced obsidian that we've done. Um, um, a early study in New Britain and a more recent study in the Willamette Peninsula of a larger, oops, a larger number of uh, objects. And you can see the sources change a little bit through time. The, the way the social networks are being brokered and organized are obviously not the same, but obsidian, the trade, the exchange, the interest and emphasis on social networks is consistent through time. And so I'm thinking this is a kind of resilience. Um, this doesn't change. This stays the same. And you can imagine why that would be. If there's a volcanic eruption, where are you going to go? You have to have friends. If you go somewhere and you don't know the people and you have no relationships, they could kill you. That could be the end of it. So if you've been exchanging things and creating these social networks, you have the opportunity to refuge and wait for the environment to return um, to a state where you can go back. So it's pretty, we think that, that it, it's nothing to do with the stone particularly, it's to do with the social networks. And the stone is just showing us that this is going on. Probably a lot of other things were moving around as well. So that's resilience. Um, another interesting sort of resilient thing is although the abandonment, this is for just the um, isthmus area, the abandonment history doesn't show that people are necessarily getting better at anything. What is interesting is that this, the test pits we have where people have come back to the same place is reasonable. Um, the sample is quite small at the bottom. Um, but it's, it's fairly high. It's a high reoccupation percentage of people coming back to the same place again and again after the eruptions. Remember, we just put these test pits in all around the place. We didn't know where to put them. So it's a fairly random sample. Um, so that means that also points out that there's a high reoccupation. Now, one aspect, one little case of this is before WK2, 
there was a big tidal embayment on this side of the peninsula. It's a shallow sea that was in there. WK2 was a major eruption and the ash was up in the mountains and came that were catastrophic flooding down into the embayment and filled it in. So today it's flat land. It's swampy, but it's flat land. It all got filled in. So that's a fairly massive change for people to get their heads around and um, think about. But if you look at the hill, the the close hills in the distance. This was an area, of course, this was all sea or shallow sea. And there were lots of sites, um, settlements or use areas in these areas where people, uh, we found lots of earth ovens, lots of um, stone tools. Um, and after the WK2 eruption, these areas have the earliest re reoccupation dates. So it isn't as if people, it's as if people knew where to go. They didn't just come onto the coast and gradually work their way inland. They went back to places that they knew, even though they were completely changed, totally unrecognizable. There's no longer a sea there. Um, they went back as if these were special places. And there also, there's uh, pottery in these places as well, which has an implication that, again, they were perhaps special places. So there seems to be some sort of memory for what's going on. One possibility is that after the eruption, people don't, they can't live there, but they come back to their homelands. They keep track of their homelands. They look where things are. They're still owning it. They're still caring about it. But how do they maintain this after uh, over long periods of time? Well, there's an interesting case study by Russell Blong, who worked on a volcanic eruption from Long Island and traced the tephra from that eruption. He went and um, talked to people in this area in the area where the tephra fell and collected stories. Now this is, you know, a thousand years ago, this happened. And there's still stories about the sky being dark, the ash falling down. Um, they don't relate it to a particular event. Often it might be a sort of mythological story or, you know, something happened long ago. But these events are important and therefore they get remembered and passed down. So human societies have the ability to carry on information and knowledge from over long periods of time. And this sort of thing has been noted in many parts of the Pacific in volcanic areas where people have stories about very old volcanoes. And then the geologists go in and find out their stories are completely accurate. They describe the nature of the eruption. So there may be active um, action taken to remember these events and also go back, keep care of your area um, so that you can reoccupy. Now, after an eruption, this is Pinatupo, a friend of mine gave me these. You can see that the place is pretty blitzed, covered with ash, there's a little bit of green. And so you can't go back and live there. You can't garden there immediately, particularly if um, everyone had sort of assumed that uh, these early people in Papua New Guinea were not very intensive cultivators, that they would cut down the forest and make a garden and then move on, highly shifting agriculture and that they would, after an eruption, would wait for the forest to regenerate before coming back. So we wanted to look at this um, and we did some soil sampling. We looked at things called phytoliths because pollen doesn't preserve in, in this tropical dry. Well, it just, so there are things called phytoliths which are um, silica parts of plants 
And you can also sometimes look at starch grains, but these researchers were looking at phytoliths to try to reconstruct the vegetation history. So what one thing they have is the history of carbon. So you can see early on, there's not very much burning going on. And the implication was that people were just coming back, making small gardens, not really doing much. But after WK2, there are big peaks and even bigger peaks after the Decatau DK eruption. The interpretation of this is that people are being are, are taking over and, and instead of waiting for the whole um, thing to um, regenerate, they're taking an active view and getting in and planting and organizing sooner. And the same is if you look at the pattern of grasses. So you don't have much going on until after WK2. These are the weeds that grow in the, in the gardens. So it seems that people are coming back earlier, burning what the, the vegetation that's there and then planting gardens and have a more intensive agricultural system. And that means they can come back sooner. They don't have to wait for the forest to regenerate. So, I mean, that's what a forest looks like. It's really hard to live in. But if you're a hunter-gatherer or low-level agriculturalist, you might do that. But this is more what we think is going on, that people are coming in, slash and burn um, uh, with intensive agriculture earlier, earlier um, through time. Uh, and there's a sort of interesting um, story from the Rabal eruption of 1996. Remember, I showed you Rabal at the other end of the island, where here is two guys. It's only a few months after the eruption. They're coming back and they're laying out their territorial boundaries on top of the ash where their land was. Pretty hard to see. You know, their houses are gone, the trees are gone, everything's gone, but they are going back and claiming that territory. And by 2008, they've come back and they have a little house. They brought in trees. They've actually planted trees.